As we continue our discussions of church multiplication through micro churches, I want to talk today about macro serving micro. In other words, the larger group serving the smaller group, which is something that gets pretty much backwards in most church situations, which is why we don't see a lot of multiplication. And so this is really talking about a new network paradigm. And as we get into this, the basis for all of this is an understanding that God intends for everyone to play. The Bible says that we are a royal priesthood. That means everybody in the church is a priest. And I want to read a couple of scriptures. I know you know these verses, but I want to point something out that I think is really crucial. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now that brings everybody in the New Testament church into the act. That's really the goal, which doesn't happen in our spectator churches. We're inviting people, attracting people, so we can entertain people, we can feed them, we can make them feel good about themselves, good about their spirituality, but then they don't produce very much. This is a thought that sometimes gets pushed to the side, but it's an eternal thought with God. And I want to take you back to the Old Testament. And we're reading from Isaiah chapter 61. And this is what Jesus quotes in Luke chapter 4 when he kind of comes on with his purpose statement. It says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, the kingdom of God is near you. It goes on and says, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord, and they, the other people around about, shall speak of you as ministers of our God. So this is something that has been in the heart of God for a long time, but it's seldom in the hearts of the pastors of the churches that we lead. Yeah, we do do the little shape tests, and we try to put everybody to work in the church, but we're not doing a very good job of putting everybody to work outside the church, or at least outside the this, this Sunday morning meeting, if you would. And so I put up a couple of slides here. One is a picture of the micro serving the macro. This is where we use the cell group, the small group, what I would call a micro church inside the congregation to feed into the congregation or to support what goes on on the weekend. Certainly we want to harvest their tithe, all of those things. If we do decide to reproduce the church, uh, then it's really a two-way street because we're still gathering something from them. I know of churches that have planted other churches and then they still ask them to send money back to the mother church. Uh, a little bit the opposite of the way that I see things. I look at everything through the lens of the macro serving the micro. And so in, you look in this illustration toward the left side of the picture, you see what I would see as the mi micro churches inside the congregation, the orange arrows. And, and everything that we're doing from inside the congregation, inside the the center, if you would, the spiritual center, the logistic center, the administrative center is there to support the leadership and the people, the priests of God, in those micro churches inside of our church. Then once we begin to multiply churches and we're starting to plant toward the outside, you can see the blue arrow as it moves in an outward direction. And we're not really asking a whole lot of these people other than that they stay in fellowship with us. We're sponsors we're not harvesters of whatever God is building in the lives of our people. As we look at this, uh, I want us to think about macro leadership supporting outward micro momentum. Macro leadership supporting outward or outwardly directed micro momentum. As I'm thinking about attracting, because we got to attract people if we're going to multiply disciples, we got to attract new disciples. Uh, we've got to start new churches, which is an attractional function as we get going. Uh, even the smallest church is an attractional church. So just always remember that. As I'm looking at the scripture, I see the APES, the Ephesians 4, 10 to 16 leaders. They're there to equip and to sponsor members to grow and mature the body of Christ. So there is this attractional and then sponsoring function that happens. And then we get into the sending and supporting. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 5, 
uh, it's a really, really strong passage to warn uh, elders in the church not to lord it over the flock, not to harvest money out of the flock, not to do anything for selfish gain, but to actually care about your people. And of course, it tells the people there, the younger, to uh, stay in submission to the elders. And, and, and so here, healthy elders are exercising oversight, but it's oversight not for the benefit of the core. It's, it's oversight for the benefit of others. It's not domineering, but it's working as an example that other people can imitate. In other words, follow me as I follow Christ. Teach the people who, what I've taught you and teach them to teach others who can teach others also. And so I'm in this process that's constantly building up those who are attracted to me, supporting them, and then sending them out so that they can do kingdom work. I see this in the Jerusalem church in the book of Acts. And, and, and first it starts with support in Jerusalem, where you see that Jesus taught in Solomon's portico in the temple in John chapter 10. Uh, it became an apostolic support center. If you read that into, maybe I am reading too much, I'm not sure, into Acts chapter 2, where it says everybody continued the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, prayer, all that. The apostles' teaching had to be taking place in the temple courts. It talks about the meeting in the temple and meeting from house to house. Later on, we see Peter and John in chapter 3 heal a layman as they're on their way to Solomon's portico to do whatever they did that day. And then, of course, you find the apostles continuing to minister in Solomon's portico of the temple in Acts chapter 5. And so this support model actually starts in Jerusalem. And then there's support from Jerusalem as the, as the church expands into Antioch and then it expands into the rest of the Mediterranean world and and then everybody starts to have conflict because the Jewish believers in Jerusalem were demanding circumcision. A lot of what happened to Paul that wasn't very good was caused by Christians who were still hanging on to the Old Testament laws. And so uh, we see in Acts chapter 16, after the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, the support that the Jerusalem Council or the church in Jerusalem, the macro, gave to the micro, as it says, they went on their way through the cities, they delivered for them the observance of the decision that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. And so the churches, the micro churches, the small churches, the hinterland churches, were strengthened in faith and they increased in their numbers daily. A church multiplication movement was in full swing with the support of the macro the micro was growing and multiplying. So let's just stop for a minute and talk about what happens when leadership centers on itself, like it basically has done for the last how many years in the United States or in the Western world, for sure. And the scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, you can never satisfy them. They'll be slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Doesn't that sound like the culture that we live in? I mean, the general culture, this would be descriptive of that. But certainly inside the churches, we have just developed a generation of, of self-serving people. And we've put positioned ourselves to serve them. What you build with is what you're going to have to continue to feed. You build a monster in attracting people to your church. You're going to have to continue to feed that monster. And so here I am talking about the macro serving the micro, about the center giving to others. But I'm not talking about that we keep serving up a diet of, you know, better entertainment, better worship experience, um, feed you better, whatever. What I'm talking about is that we support you as our disciples. We support you in your disciple-making efforts. We train you to lead others to do what we do. We multiply ourselves in you before we ever think of multiplying a church. As we get into this a little bit further, there's, there's some things that we can learn from the life of John Wesley. 
Wesley structured uh, and, and a modified cell group model. These were called class meetings and they were bonded together as they grew or they morphed into as they grew what he called Methodist societies, which actually grew into an international movement. But the core always served the fringes and they largely did this by producing teaching materials and then whatever they needed to do to perhaps give money or to support this whole system that they had of the circuit riders. And the, the genius of the Wesleyan movement was actually kind of fourfold. First, it's just simply that the macro was there to serve the micro. Secondly, every member was expected to function as a priest. Everybody was a representative of Jesus Christ. Third, the class meetings morphed into churches, uh, which is something that we just kind of lost out in the general church in America today. If you look at the Baptists on the early frontier of America, you know, they just launch a guy out in a village someplace and, you know, in their situation, kind of give him two weeks training in a Bible and let him go. And that's how come there's more Baptists today than there are of anybody else. Historically, they, they were imitating what Wesley did. I think imitating what the Apostle Paul and Barnabas did. The fourth thing that was important is that the circuit riders were there to support, not dominate lay pastors. We don't understand this whole circuit riding thing. Many people kind of view the early Methodist circuit riders as a guy who'd maybe preach in three different villages in a day. That's not what happened. He, he, he would have a round of villages, maybe as many as 12. Usually the circuit rider lived in the household of a big city pastor. He had access to his library. He was mentored by that guy. And then there were lay pastors in the towns and the villages. And this guy might go, you know, once every three months, he would show up. He would be there to support you, to benefit you, to bless you, to train you, to do whatever he could. He wasn't there to dominate you. Learning from that, I want us to think about cell church and the idea of cell church that was so popular in the 1980s, because that's really what Hope Chapel was. Uh, and I want to point out this, a church with cell groups is not a cell church. A church of cell groups is a cell church. In other words, a cell church is combined or comprised of cell groups and centers on them rather than centering on the larger gathering. It's back to the illustration that I showed you earlier. The macro serves and services the micro. And in a cell church, cell leaders are equipped as and identified as pastors, and they're enabled or they're licensed, whatever, to perform what we call sacramental duties. They can do weddings, they can do funerals, they can do baptisms, they can do baby dedications, they can serve communion, uh, they function as pastors. And of course, this feeds into a church multiplication movement. As somebody is successful doing this inside the church, we're going to push them outside the church and good things are going to happen. Micro churches, like cell groups or class meetings, are a biblical function of the church. They can function anywhere. That's the cool thing. They can, they can work in cafes and pubs and parks and food courts. They can work online. I'm leading a microchurch right now online. We just got a new member this week. We're trying to limit the thing, keep it small. It wants to grow big in a hurry. We've, we've got eight people now, and we're trying to just keep it people who are really needing what we have to offer. But truth is, the pandemic didn't hurt us at all. It hurt a lot of churches, but it didn't hurt us. And in fact, we started in the middle of the pandemic. But microchurches inside the church and outside do need support. And they need support from a network center that's designed to help them to thrive as they survive. As we go a little further into this, I created a diagram, uh, an electric motor metaphor. And what I'm really thinking about is this business of attracting and repelling of magnets and, and how it would liken itself to what we do as leaders in the church, attracting and not perhaps repelling, but attracting and sending. On the one hand, we're saying come. On the other hand, we're saying go. And so as you look at the electric motor, there are several components to the thing. Uh, there is a, a surrounding magnet, and I've kind of made it into two colors. It's one continuous magnet, but every magnet has a North Pole and a South Pole. And we don't fully understand magnetism. Science still doesn't fully understand magnetism, but we know that there's a north and a south to every magnet. And by the way, those terms are just arbitrary. And then 
And as you look inside the motor, the white dot in the center of the diagram is the, the, the rotor or the axle to the motor. And then uh, I've made it into a rectangle, the armature in most electric motors. It's a big surrounding uh, bundle of wires that creates electromagnets within. And so each electromagnet is going to have a north pole and a south pole. But if you keep swapping the current back and forth, north to south, south to north, north to south, south to north, uh, then that the magnetic tips of that thing are going to be uh, attracted and, and then repelled by either the north or the south pole of the larger magnet that surrounds it. And so if you turn the current on, off, on, off, on, off, not so much on, off, but north, south, north, south, north, south. In other words, the current moving through the, the two yellow wires there switches back and forth between north and south. Then the, the ends of that armature are going to be uh, either attracted to the North Pole or repelled by the North Pole. The other opposite end will be attracted by the South Pole or repelled by the South Pole. And so this idea of alternating between something that attracts and something that repels, I think is a pretty good illustration of how I want to operate at church. In the next diagram, I put the word in the spirit as the North and South Pole of the magnet that would we, we would call the Big C Church, the Church of Jesus Christ. And then you see the little red brushes in there uh, up against the axle uh, inside the armature. And of course the plus and minus signs like I had before. But then just the concept here, and this is what I'm really trying to talk to you about, is that the disciple making leader attracts and sends. He does both. Come follow me as I follow Christ, go out there, and teach those other people the things that I have taught you. And it goes on from there. And it should really be something that operates eternally. But getting back to this macro supporting micro and moving toward a movement, I want to just point out two ways, and there, there's a multiplicity in each, but I want to point out two ways that I think that we need to kind of summarize this thing. And here's the takeaways. Here's what you got to do. The first is that you would personally disciple disciple makers toward church multiplication. Now, this is going to include face to face disciple making with at least a few people, you know, seven to 12 people, maybe the inner core of your church staff, and then they do face to face disciple making with others. This includes hands on experience. In our situation, what we've been talking about is that you have people as apprentices in a micro church, learning how to do the job and then the leader leaves and, and they become the pastors and hopefully they'll leave and multiply the thing again and again. There should be prayer. Things should be bathed in prayer. There needs to be group training. You've got to have materials that you provide for them. In our situation, we've always just gathered other people's books. I've realized you can kind of curriculize anything if you get people together to read about it and, and then talk about it. And then those three questions that we're always asking in the micro churches and in the leadership groups, what did the spirit say to you? What are you going to do about it? And how can we come alongside and help you as you function as a priest in the kingdom of God? There should be hero making that's ongoing. Uh, you're, you're holding up the people who are doing the right things in front of the larger congregation. And then there should be exposure to the success of other movements, which I assume is why you're actually looking at this thing, because you're looking at the success that I've had in my lifetime. The second business here, as a pastor or a planter leaves, as he leaves or she leaves, and after he or she leaves, then you provide network services. And this would include things like obviously funding as they go out the door, uh, an ongoing relationship uh, in either in a network setting or just a personal thing, email from time to time, phone calls once in a while, uh, praying together. Again, hero making, you want to hold up the people that are doing it right to the entire movement. And so this is hero making on a different level. Continuing education with network generated teaching tools. Now, I think it's really good that your network would watch this teaching series. You know, that's why I created it. But 
you need to be generating materials, uh, starting with a book about the history of your movement and where the movement's going and why it's going there and all of that. You need to generate tools that you can place in the hands of the people. There needs to be support coming from the core, macro serving the micro. There, there can be, if you're close enough, tech support. There could be office space, you know. We're seeing church buildings all over the country with surplus space these days. If you're planting churches within a 20, 30 mile radius, uh, you can give them office space. You can easily give them tech support. Uh, you can give them support with web design, no matter where they are in the world. There's just a, a host of things that you can do. Macro serving micro. I want to leave you with this one scripture, and I'm pulling it a little bit out of context, but I think the application is quite clear. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, that if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household or for those of the household of faith, then he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Boy, that scripture grabs my heart because I look at ways that I think I have failed. I've succeeded in a lot of things, but I think I failed to really hold together the network. The, the, you know, there's all these churches that we planted that I don't know the pastors, and we didn't do anything in a real organized fashion to keep them glued together. And so in some ways, this scripture is a challenge to me in that I didn't provide for my own. And especially for those of our household, I did inside the church. I, I did with those that were local to the church, the ones that we sent out. But beyond that, didn't do a, a very hot job. Well, I don't think I've denied the faith, and I'm worse than an unbeliever, but this scripture is a challenge to me, and I hope it's a challenge to you. Remember, the macro is there to serve the micro.